what is the reason for the word comparative in the title of our program? And this is um, something that's unique to our program from its founding. Um, from the founding of CMS, uh, our faculty, labs, and curriculum have all emphasized critical analyses of the role of media in society that are comparative in various different ways across different media forms, spaces, communities and practices, across different historical periods, across different local and global and subcultural contexts, cultural and subcultural contexts, utilizing methodologies drawn from the humanities, the social sciences, uh, and computational sciences, while also drawing upon the insights of different forms of media production, design, and practice. Our faculty, labs, and researchers um, uh, reflect this diversity in the, in the approach to critical media analysis and production. Among our faculty and researchers, you will find individuals who are primarily media pr practitioners, others who are primarily media scholars and theorists, um, and others who combine media scholarship and practice in their work. This is particularly productive and even a quite heady mix at times. The conversations and collaborations it fosters are what makes MIT's Comparative Media Studies program a uniquely generative space for scholarship, research, and graduate study. The research groups themselves um, are part of what makes, oh, sorry. oh you're ahead of me, <laughs> are part of what makes the CMS program unique. Uh, we currently have nine research groups under the umbrella of comparative media studies, uh, each one of which is engaged at the intersection of critical media research and practice. Some of these are labs led by our faculty members with funding from various granting agencies. Others are led by research scientists. And the majority of our master's students are funded through, uh, excuse me, um, through work, either through work that they do in one of the research groups uh, or with um, an individual faculty member as a research assistant. Uh, each year the program is further enriched by visiting scholars and practitioners. Visitors are often associated with specific re research groups um, or, um, uh, and often they will also teach a course as part of their time here. So, for example, one of our um, visitors in um, the Open Documentary Lab um, has gone on to teach a course in VR production for um, nonfiction storytelling. Um, uh, our two year curriculum is a mix of required foundations courses and electives that students can choose from within CMS's broader offerings. And I'll sort of pass things on to, to Lisa to talk a bit about the curriculum. Here are the research group directors. Um, and we also just wanted to mint, hi, I'm Lisa Parks, and I'm a professor in comparative media studies. And I'm also affiliated with the Science, Technology, and Society program as well. Um, and our research groups have different directors. Some are faculty, and some are research scientists, and teach classes as well. Um, and we'll probably hear more about that in a bit. Beyond the um, research groups, one of the wonderful things about Comparative Media Studies grad program is that we often have an array of visiting scholars and postdocs, and these are just a few of our recent examples. I don't know how many people have heard of Ta-Nehisi Coates, but uh, you know, a famous writer. Between Me and the World, I believe, was one of the first books that really um, made him become really famous, but an incredible writer. And then we've had postdoc fellows. One of our recent postdoc fellows is Liz Kosloff. She was a Mellon postdoc fellow here who's, who came to us from NYU as a PhD student. She graduated in the Media, Culture, and Communication Department and was doing fascinating research on media and climate change and how communities are dealing with those issues. And then she uh, got cherry-picked by UCLA for a very great professor job after working here. 
but she did, she taught a class. She also worked a lot with our other grad students. And so I, I bring this up because sometimes we've got our faculty, but we also have visitors and people coming in and out of this community that if you join the department, you would have an opportunity to benefit from those visitors and guests too. Um, often the Open Doc Lab will have fellows who are film and media makers and artists joining our community and giving presentations or having longer term residencies as well. So with that overview that uh, Vivek uh, got us through, uh, I also, we, we also wanted to go through the curriculum a little bit because you're here not only to engage with faculty but you will be sitting in classes, right? Um, that's part of being in graduate school is the courses are a little different usually. You're mostly in smaller seminars than um, big lecture classes, although sometimes you would have an option to take a lecture class that's larger. But in, in the first year in the CMS graduate program, during semester one, um, the students take uh, three courses. Media Theories and Methods 1, so you're introduced to theoretical works and methodological approaches in the field. There's also a class that's required in the core curriculum called Major Media Texts, which focuses on approaches like from textual analysis, so you look at the narrative structure of a film or the meaning-making processes of a game interface. Um, how a television show develops meanings that produce a fan community. Um, so you're dealing with kind of the culture and meaning-making processes embedded within a various, uh, a, a variety of media, film media, game texts in that class. Um, and then you do a workshop which is more of an applied media studies class where you'll have opportunities not just to read and think about things, but to actually make media collaboratively with other people in your cohort. And that is often taught by Professor Parody. He may pop in later, but um, the students tend to really like that class as a way of breaking up a lot of the reading that you end up doing in the other classes in the workshop class, you're getting your hands on equipment. You're learning data visualization skills. You might do a, a media mapping project to deal with a particular phenomenon. You might even just do a short video project that documents something of interest to you and your group. Um, beyond that, then, we have a colloquium. And we actually have one today at 5 o'clock for those of you that can stick around. And the head of our department, Eric, will be giving a talk. Um, but uh, colloquium is every week at, from 5 to 6.30 or 7. And that tends to be a time of listening to people come give lectures about their work. Usually we have people both on campus and off campus come and give colloquium talks. And you get a, usually have a yummy meal of pizza or what, whatever you've been having lately. A lot of pizza, salad, for those of you that like healthy foods. <laughs> um, and, and there's a lot of, it's kind of like a community, bringing the group of the grad students together with faculty and other researchers in the community. We usually hold that um, over in the media lab building in this com comparative media studies area. And just to give you a sense of some of the recent talks we've had, we, Professor William Arricchio, who some of you may know, he's a media historian and also is director of, uh, co-director involved in leading the Open Doc Lab. He gave a talk recently. Um, Lucy Suchman, who is a really interesting scholar in science, technology, and society, and some of her work is also overlapping with human-computer interaction, which is a field of research. She came last week and gave a really fascinating talk. And, standing room only, we were kind of, you know, students and myself included were sitting on the floor for a while and because uh, there were so many people there. And then another talk about imperial arrangements, South African apartheid and the force of photography by Kimberly Juanita Brown. Um, so just to give you a sense, we, you can go on our website and look at an archive of podcasts that exist uh, for a sense of talks we get. In the second year, um, during semester one, you do a class called Media in Transition. 
which uh, is a historical class that zooms in on moments in which media technologies are in flux and are shifting. And a lot of times that's a, a moment where um, media formats also get reconfigured, redefined, and shoot off in new directions. Um, so so that class, is, class has been taught by William Arricchio as well as Ed Schiappa, I believe, and others. Um, then you take two electives. That's an exciting semester because you're not required to just, I mean, our core is wonderful and robust and rigorous and creative, but here's a semester where you get to take two electives outside of the core curriculum of CMS. And you can use that opportunity to take classes in an area that may dovetail with the thesis that you're going to be developing later that, in, in, in that second year. So, and then you also continue to participate in the colloquium. During the semester two of you, uh, semester, second semester of year two, you're, you're pretty much focusing exclusively on your thesis research. And you're writing it up. Uh, we have an exciting thesis day in April, and all of the students um, present their theses in public and do a presentation that's live streamed and attended by members of the MIT community as well as the greater Boston area. We have sometimes people coming from around the area for that event. Um, and beyond that, did you I'll have just, some? I'll just add, um, in terms of the thesis, one of the, um, you know, since it is a, a, a relatively short, you know, two-year program, um, the, the process of, of developing the thesis is baked into the core courses. So for example, from the very first semester, um, one of the assignments, one of the end of year assignments of, of one of the core classes um, has you um, pre, uh, create a, a, a document, a um, annotated bibliography around a particular topic that you are sort of leaning towards um, in, in terms of uh, an area that you may want to explore for your thesis. So you start, you know, reading some of the, the texts that might be the most relevant for that, that topic. Um, and, um, and then in the, the second and third semesters, each semester ends with um, sort of another step closer to your thesis. Um, I believe that the second semester, the first year at the end of that semester, you produce a thesis proposal. Um, and then over the, the summer, in between the two years, often students will be using that period of time to start doing research um, on their thesis topic that then they'll be working into the actual writing process in the, the second year. So it's um, the, that part of the, the process, the thesis writing process, is, is built into the curriculum in that way. Yeah, we have people in their first year right now which are, you know, we're getting to the, toward the end of the first semester of the first year for our current cohort, and they're turning in an annotated bibliography in the media theories and methods class, and that bibliography is supposed to support a thesis-related uh, topic. So you look into a bunch of different research articles and books related to an area that you are personally interested in to do that background research and a kind of literature review to prepare you to conduct further research in an area. So as Vivek was saying, the, it's, it's set up to allow a, a facilitation process of your research evolving incrementally and then culminating in the end of the second year into the thesis. And that's always a really exciting process for us just to see what people come up with. To give you a sense of recent examples, um, my, I really have to have my glasses checked. <laughs> I'm going to look up here because <laughs> the screen on here is really small. Um, this was a couple of years ago, but we had a variety of different topics. I'm not going to read them all, but they ranged from um, you know, local journalism and, and civic life to, um, you know, study of social media and disease outbreaks and how social media are, were kind of integral in reporting on um, disease outbreaks. Um, 
the theses that if you do we have a full re, like a list of all of them online okay. I encourage you if you're thinking about applying to the program and getting a sense of the kind of work that gets done to look at a full list online because it really gives you a sense of all the possibilities here it's not a program that really tries to funnel you in a really narrow direction. Instead, it's a program that's a platform where you can really um, flourish in terms of exploring your own interests and dialogue with the faculty and also your peers. Um, I think the cohorts get a lot of solidarity and learn a lot from one another, too. Um, these theses don't just sit in a dusty old library somewhere. Sometimes they end up turning into books. And we're really proud that many of our alums have taken their theses and turned them into books. And I'm just going to flip through a few of these. Molly uh, Sauter's The Coming Swarm. Um, we have uh, Aswin's book, From Bombay to Bollywood. Um, I have, I've read some of these, but not all. So I need to add some of these to my reading list. Um, this is. My eyes. Candace Callison's book, How Climate Change Comes to Matter. I believe she gave a commencement address here at MIT last yeah, year, the didn't she? Yeah, so this is an alum out of CMS who was giving a, a commencement address to the doctoral ceremony here last year. And she was just invited to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences as well. So some of our alums go on to not only um, publish books, but also to do really high impact work. Um, here's another one called um, Networking Peripheries, Technological Futures, and the Myth of Digital Universalism. The list keeps going on. A lot of times, master's theses don't turn into books. So you should know that usually it's a PhD dissertation that com becomes a book, not often a master's thesis. So we also have um, Kevin Driscoll's book on Minitel, uh, Brian Jacobson's book, Studio Before the System, Studios Before the System, on like the electrification of. Uh, the electrification infrastructure in the Paris film studios at the turn of the century. Uh, this is a long list. The, what is this one called? I can't see. Gaff, Gaff Stutter. Um, I don't know this project, do you? But we're showing all these slides because we are just really proud of these people. <laughs> and then alumni do. Um, <coughs> A variety of different careers. They some of them go into academia and or publish books and become kind of public intellectuals and contribute through their writing and, and scholarship. And um, others go into the media industries. Um, we've had people be a radio and podcast strategist, a fellow in the San Francisco Mayor's Office of Civic Innovation. Um, Somebody went on to be a manager of digital entertainment at the Andy Warhol Museum, product manager, Apple Consumer Intelligence, um, a program manager at Etsy, a grad student that just uh, graduated last year, Matt Graydon um, from CMS, just got a job last week, a pretty high level job in the area of trust and digital safety and security at Twitter. Um, another student from a couple years ago just went to IDEO. Um, so, so interesting career placement happens out of the program and we're really proud of the alums, especially the having 20 years of alums and a community that stays pretty well networked, thanks to Andrew Whitaker, who always updates our alumni online. Um, so we encourage you to have a look. I'm sure some of you have already looked at the website. But we encourage you to go check out a lot more information that's available on that website. And if you have questions, make sure to reach out to us, to individual faculty members, to our staff in the department. Um, Shannon is a total expert when it comes to the graduate program, and it really couldn't uh, be run without her. We also have with us today Professor Jing Wong, who is a faculty member in CMS. and. Um, maybe we could have you talk a little bit about the work that you do. Yeah, sure. Um, nice meeting you all. Uh, 
my name is Jane Wang, and I've been teaching at MIT since 2001, so it's been 18 years. Uh, my research uh, revolves around the new media and its impact on civic communities on the one hand, and its impact on uh, entertainment industry on the other hand. Uh, I just finished writing a book on civic media, uh, which was based on my 10-year-long uh, experience of running a, a grassroots NGO in Shenzhen, China. Uh, my collaborators in China and I practice ICT-powered activism. You know what ICT stands for? Information Communication Technology. So I have a second life outside of uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. At the same time, I'm also pursuing research on the digital disruptions in the media sector. And I look at the, the current trends, just to give you some ideas. Um, Time-shifted viewing, um, narrow casting, TV everywhere, um, social e-commerce, and uh, interactive video. So those are trends that have rocked the industry, uh, both in the US and in China. And I look at uh, both the technology and business aspects of those disruptions, asking who benefited, who benefited from them, and uh, what the ecosystem of streaming media looks like, and how the future of content likely would likely evolve. So that's a really quick bird's eye view of what I do. Uh, now, to give you a general sense of um, the diverse research interests of our former graduate students, Lisa, Professor Lisa Parks showed us uh, some uh, thesis, uh, some thesis titles. I'm going to share with you more titles of uh, a few theses that I supervised. So here's the list. A case study of the Ars Electronica Future Lab, experiments in corporate uh, collaboration. Ars Electronica is an Austrian cultural, educational, and scientific institute, very active in the new field of uh, media arts. Uh, and then the other one is Negotiating Realists, uh, the sixth generation of Chinese filmmakers. Electric Signs in Manhattan, 1881 to 1917. That was a thesis on outdoor advertising. Journey to the East. The remake of Chinese animation. Online BBS Sphere. Sphere. BBS is a traditional um, internet forum system. Um, the hidden activism, media practices and media opportunities in the Chinese politics of resistance. And um, hackers, geeks, and makers, creativity in the Chinese technology community. And the last one. Theorizing a decentralized internet, controversies over data ownership, recommendation system, and surveillance capitalism. So this is just a, well, as you can tell, there are a very uh, diverse uh, topics uh, of research interests. Uh, and I look forward to learning from you about your interests. Thank you. Would you, make, would you like to say a few things? Yes, uh, I'll uh, talk a little bit about the MIT Game Lab, uh, where I'm the research coordinator. I'm Michael Jacobson, uh, by the way. And uh, uh, we do teaching, we do research, and uh, we also play games. Uh, we have uh, about six or seven uh, uh, classes that, that we offer. Uh, roughly half of them on game design in one form or another, and the others about uh, game culture and understanding games as a cultural media phenomenon. Um, and um, uh, we often, um, there's uh, two of the class, uh, the classes I teach have uh, uh, graduate student versions of them. So one is uh, introduction to uh, video game theory, and the other one is playful and social interaction design exploration. Uh, so it's uh, the second one is a studio-based class uh, for graduate students uh, where we do uh, uh, design research and, and trying to figure out what that means in terms of uh, what kind of findings you can hope for and how to disseminate them or uh, evaluate them as well. Um, a couple of uh, the projects that we're doing in the lab currently. 
Um, we're doing uh, one that sort of has uh, uh, exploded into uh, a number of uh, uh, sub-projects. So it started out as a study of colonialist themes in board games, just uh, uh, playing and critiquing uh, these games, uh, uh, which is a book project that I have together with uh, uh, Professor Mary Flanagan from Dartmouth uh, College. But in the process, we got so fed up with these colonialist themes, so we started doing post-colonial or counter-colonial games uh, together with uh, uh, game designers from uh, communities that have been negatively affected by, by colonialism. So we've been going to Puerto Rico and working, doing workshops with game designers there. Uh, that has uh, sprouted a... Uh, board game which is in proto prototype stage right now so we're we're going to have a visiting artist from Puerto Rico a comic book artist uh, coming next semester uh, to work with us on illustrations and graphic design and further design of, of, uh, of that game that we will in some form publish uh, uh, later next year and um, uh, we've also been going to Colombia, and we've been doing workshops here at MIT uh, with game designers who are interested in these issues and, and want to see uh, uh, board games, but also video games dealing with these issues in, in more interesting uh, and fruitful ways. Um, another project that we're currently doing is um, uh, sponsored by Boast, uh, the headphone manufacturers. So they have developed some new technology for uh, audio augmented reality. So uh, uh, often when we say AR, we think of, of uh, things that, digital things that appear to exist out in, in, in our uh, uh, physical environment. Uh, but in this case, it would be uh, auditory objects or uh, auditory swear spheres that are being placed in our environment and we can uh, experience them with our ears as, as we move through them. Uh, so uh, for us, this was an opportunity, again, to, to have uh, students practice uh, design-based research and, uh, and uh, uh, try to uh, populated, uh, uh, so far very sparsely populated design space of uh, audio AR artifacts and see if we can sort of tease out what potential qualities and in use experiences that, that can, can exist I I in that space. Um, so um, that project is started out over summer with uh, us and some uh, uh, undergrad researchers working with us in the lab, uh, sort of coming up with seeds of uh, uh, of mechanics that that can could then be used by the students in the class that we're currently teaching during the uh, fall semester, and then we're going to switch back into research and production mode again in January. Uh, and hire some of the students from the class to work with us in the project to to refine some of the the more interesting ideas to to high fidelity prototypes. We do a lot of development. We are a functioning game development studio uh, on campus, but we usually don't go all the way to a commercial product because a lot of the interest we have in uh, the games that we're making is understanding things that can only be understood by actually creating the thing. But often we, f we get the understanding or the knowledge that we need before it's being taken all the way to a fully polished, marketable commercial product. So uh, it happens uh, sometimes in terms of students spinning off their ideas for themselves or uh, uh, in, the, in the case of uh, uh, the, the new Puerto Rico board game where uh, we have been talking to uh, board game publishers who just like the idea so that much that they want to work with us to, to make it a, 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 an accessible 
product even if they can't make any money uh, from it. Uh, so uh, finally, uh, the, the playing games part, we believe that if we are going to be experts at this thing, it's not enough that we study games and that we make games and we teach games, we also have to continue playing games to not sort of lose touch with, uh, with the essence of the thing that we're uh, pretending to be experts at. So, so uh, we try to play games at least once a week. Um, depending on the cohorts, the graduate students are more or less engaged in, in those activities, but, but when it comes to the colonial board games, I really need people to help me play these games that can sometimes be uh, quite depressing and racist and so on, but, but we also try to uh, sort of balance that with also playing games for fun. Uh, since we're doing the Bose project right now, we've been doing a lot of rhythm, rhythm games and other music games. We've sort of gone through the history of, uh, of uh, rhythm games from, from early Japanese uh, uh, first generation PlayStation games to uh, current state of, of the genre and there are strong ties there to MIT through uh, harmonics being fu founded by, by MIT alum students, for instance. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Great, thanks. Um, would you like to oh. talk about your um, work? Sure. Do you have time? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, as I said, I'm Vivek Bald, and um, I am a documentary filmmaker and a historian. Um, and I also work in sort of newer forms of digital media based storytelling. Um, my, um, my kind of broad interests in, in the field of media um, have to do with um, the, the intersection between media or the connection between media and both the, the exercise and, and contestation of power. Um, so um, my my theoretical um, background within, within media studies is really on the cultural studies side, particularly British cultural studies, um, and you know, work that, um, that has sort of looked at both uh, the ways that, that states and corporations um, uh, sort of um, consolidate and maintain power, social power, um, as well as the ways in which everyday people or subcultures then um, are able to challenge that power, challenge representations with counter representations, et cetera, um, in the field of popular culture. Um, that, that has been sort of a grounding for me both as a documentary filmmaker and um, as a scholar. Um, uh, some of my scholarship is more traditionally historical. I, um, my interests uh, on that side have to do with histories of, of um, immigration to the United States and very particularly Asian and South Asian immigration um, during the period from the late 19th century to the mid 20th century when, um, when migration from Asia had been banned um, in a way that's sort of similar to what had been, has been called for by the current administration. Um, with regard to Muslim immigration. So there was an entire uh, you know, period of, of almost 60, 70 years when, when migration from Asia was banned. And that's the historical period that I look at, um, in particular looking at um, a couple of early communities of undocumented Muslim migrants from what is now present day Bangladesh and um, West Bengal in India, and these were men who worked on colonial steamships and then jumped ship in US ports and sort of disappeared into other communities of color and married within those communities. Um, so that particular project is not just a historical, um, you know, work of historical scholarship. Um, it's a book, um, but I'm working, um, working on this as a transmedia project where um, the book is just one out of three parts of the larger project, the second and third of which being um, I'm currently uh, finishing a feature-length documentary film that is slated for broadcast on PBS 
um, that follows the son of one of these men who jumped ship in New York in the 1930s and settled in Harlem. Um, and then the third part of it is a web-based oral history project, um, which is a, a kind of platform for um, the descendants of, of this kind of unique community to record their own stories, upload photographs, um, and essentially be engaged in the telling of their own history. Um, so uh, that that particular project, um, with that particular project, I'm, I'm on the long term interested in how we can use different forms of uh, media, particularly digital media, to create spaces for um, those who have been written out of history to um, author their own history. You know, and in means that are that have not typically been. Um, have not typically counted as historical archives, in, in other words, through oral traditions of storytelling as well as things like family photographs. Um, so I'm creating a digital platform for, for that to occur. Um, I teach courses in documentary film production. Um, one is uh, centered on the production of, of short documentaries for the web, like three to five minute documentaries. It's a uh, you know, a form that has has really flourished in the last ten years or so, um, and and kind of touches, you know, goes in many different directions. Um, there's another course that I teach regularly on social justice and documentary film, um, where we watch and kind of um, analyze and critique um, recent social documentaries, as well as work in teams. Um, typically, three to four teams will work toward creating their own roughly 10-minute documentary at the end of the semester. Um, and um, I, I also, um, I'm also a, a, a member of the Open Documentary Lab. Um, I'm one of the, the faculty affiliates of the lab, which, um, as mentioned, is um, run by uh, my colleague William Yurikio and my other colleague Sarah Wallison. Um, the Open Documentary Lab was started about six years ago, maybe, um, really as a, a space to gather people who are either working in or um, writing about, thinking about new forms of documentary storytelling that have been made possible by new forms of technologies, whether it's streaming and the, the possibility of creating documentaries that are non-linear and interactive, where the user is able to kind of move around the kind of digital space to look at different parts of um, a documentary, um, to like game interfaces, again, as a way of navigating through different parts of a story, um, to um, virtual reality-based documentaries and, and um, augmented reality documentary. Um, so these are all things that that the Open Documentary Lab is, is, has been engaged with, um, both in terms of bringing in um, fellows who, who meet once a week um, and are often you know, here in the area over the course of either a semester or a year. And they're typically um, people who are already working in different fields, whether it's journalism, photojournalism, documentary filmmaking, or technologists, um, other forms of storytelling, other kinds of storytellers. So, um, so that's a really fertile space, um, and, and um, where also I think typically one student per semester over the last, or, or one student per, per cohort, sorry, over the last few years has been an RA in that lab and takes part in both um, ODL's research as well as the kind of interchange that happens with the, the fellows. So, yeah, that's me. And he gave a great colloquium talk this semester where we got a preview of his um, film in progress, too, which was really wonderful. Um, so I guess uh, before we open it up for questions, I'll say a little bit about myself as a professor here and, and the research that I do. Um, so I'm a humanities-based media scholar. and. Um, my research has tended to focus in three general areas, although I don't, sometimes it meanders beyond that. But I've done uh, research on satellite technologies and media globalization, on um, surveillance culture, 
and on um, an area called media infrastructure studies, um, where we kind of look not just at the screen content um, or the audience, but we think about the distribution systems in the world that allow content to circulate, whether we're talking about satellites or the internet or local Wi-Fi systems. Um, there are a whole host of infrastructures that are necessary for audiovisual content to be able to move um, from a distribution point to audiences worldwide. And so I've been trying to find different interdisciplinary methods for studying those infrastructures. And because of that, sometimes my research as a media scholar also overlaps into fields like with international relations, sometimes with cultural geography, and sometimes with art. And I've collaborated with people across those fields as well. And I really like those kind of interdisciplinary collaborations. Um, in addition to doing research, I um, direct the Global Media Technologies and Cultures Lab here at MIT. And I should say that I just moved here, what is it, almost three or four years ago from University of California, Santa Barbara where I taught in the Film and Media Studies Department there for about 18 years before moving across the country and coming over here. And so, um, so I, I, when I was there, I directed a research center called the Center for Information Technology and Society. And I learned a lot through that process that I tried to also bring into the lab that I created here. And, um, I'll just give you a snippet of ways that we're working in the lab. Um, right now, we have a grant from the National Science Foundation with a colleague from UCLA named Ramesh Srinivasan. Um, he just published an interesting book called Beyond the Valley about computing and information technologies beyond Silicon Valley in rural, more rural disenfranchised communities around the world. Um, but we're working together to try to understand how people in rural communities that are beyond political capitals and cultural capitals, how do they think about and use the internet in their everyday lives? And do they think about the infrastructure that they use to connect to the internet? And what do they know about it? Are they curious about it? Are they interested in it? Um, are they, do they feel empowered by it? Do they feel a sense of ownership over it? So our project is called Network Sovereignty because we're interested in how people that don't see themselves at the center of political processes are imagining the internet in their everyday life worlds. So we've been doing field work in Tanzania and um, my part of the project has been in Tanzania and Africa, and, and Ramesh has been working in Mexico. And then part of the project also links with the Blackfeet Nation, the Blackfeet Indian tribe in the United States and in territories in Montana. Um, and so with that project, I've had an opportunity to have the students in CMS that have been working with me go to Tanzania with me and actually help with the field work. And we did a separate workshop when we were there. I had another student come to Montana with me last summer and run a forum in Browning, Montana to try to get a sense of how people that live in the Blackfeet Nation think about the internet and social media and how and whether they feel any empowerment and ownership over the systems that kind of end in their sovereign lands or whether they feel that the ownership is elsewhere. So like Vivek, I'm also interested in a lot of the power relationships that are woven into um, the media and information technologies that we use in the world. Um, so that Network Sovereignty Project, we have a blog on, um, I should pull up my, we have a lab website that you feel, feel free to check it out. Um, we have a blog that we just started populating in the last couple of months um, with a bunch of posts related to the overall topic of network sovereignty. So we do outreach to different scholars and activists that are also wanting to write up their work and share it as part of a research community. 
uh, we also have another part of our um, website blog, and often these blog posts are written by grad students who are working in the lab. Um, and um, I'm not going to go into all of these, but they're doing a wonderful job. Uh, the most recent one that I'm just copy editing is by um, Diego, who is from Peru and just did an interview about all the gig economy work in, per in Peru and how all the protests are, go are going on in relation to some of the work there. Um, and we're working on projects related to surveillance and a whole bunch of other issues too. We don't have time to go into everything, but I'm happy to answer questions if people um, have them. So with that, I think we should open it up to people's questions. Oh, you want to I have one from the sorry. internet? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, Mohamed Reza, uh, a app potential applicant from Iran, mm -hmm. who says, I'm currently finishing my doctoral studies in theater and performance studies. My main focus is critical race theory, Middle Eastern, and migration studies. I'm interested in CMS to explore digital racial formation on Iranian social networks and video games particularly in relation to U.S. cultural colonialism and surveillance culture. Given this, I was wondering if my background and overall research interests could fit the purview of your program and the training you offer. Um, well, I would, I would say, I mean, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, the, 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 the way in which you've described the, this project very like it immediately for me resonates in a number of different levels um, as as someone who um, studies uh, issues of, of empire and, and global inequities in, in power, um, particularly with relation to uh, South Asia and the British Empire um, in South Asia, as well as um, the ways in which um, uh, different forms of Orientalist representations of South Asians in the United States have sort of played into both the ways in which um, uh, South Asians have been simultaneously um, celebrated and demonized in in the U.S. Um, and so, my more recent work is is sort of centered on on drawing out a kind of genealogy of of those processes. Um, going back to the late 19th century um, up until the present. Um, and, you know, migration and immigration, both um, and, and political exile and, and sojourning, all these various different forms of global movement of peoples is really at the center of all the work that I've done. Um, so, you know, that sounds like an exciting project. And, and I'm sure there, there also overlaps, Lisa, with your work. Yeah, there's so many different ways to conduct research on surveillance practices, and we really need to understand um, from more international perspectives how those technologies and practices are taking shape in different parts of the world and what different policies countries have around those technologies. Um, I'm actually working on a project right now uh, based on some research we, we did last December in Washington, D.C., I took a graduate student working in my lab. We went to Washington, D.C. Um, and, and did interviews with a lot of the, the satellite operators. And we were mostly looking at the distribution of the Internet. Um, but we had a, another project in D.C. where we were also interviewing those who were working in digital rights advocacy organizations like Electronic Frontier Foundation, ACLU, EPIC, the Center for Democracy and Technology, and interviewing the people that are the workers on the front lines of um, digital privacy. And, and how are, what sources are they using? to research surveillance activities and how are they setting their advocacy agendas. Because what we see is a lot of big tech companies using black boxing. They, they protect access to, they, 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 they kind of control access to information to, about the technology and their internal operations. So it's really hard to know how these technologies are operating. And we need to be really creative and inventive about how we do research on surveillance systems, um, given the proprietary claims that big tech make to their algorithms and their, um, their practices. 
Um, so I'm writing that up right now with a colleague. Um, we call it surveillance pressure points, and we're looking at all the proliferating surveillance pressure points in the world. Great. I, I have two questions, if that's okay. Um, the first one is, for students who are interested in publishing their thesis as books, are there resources available to help with that process, or is it largely done independently? Um, and then I'm also wondering about any formal linkages with the history, anthropology, science, technology, and society program, sort of what, um, like whether you share events or uh, how professors from the different programs might support students in each other's respective programs. Don't forget to repeat the question. Oh, yes. Um, and, and I may um, I may lean on your institutional memory, Shannon, um, in terms of the first question is about um, the the process of, of going from master's thesis to book and whether the whether there's um, institutional support for for that um, for that process or whether it's happened independently. Is that correct? Um, and um, so I'll just I'll I'll start to answer that question myself, um, and that is uh, my understanding. And Shannon may may correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is that um, often that process, the the thesis to book project process, is something that happens after people have been in the program. Um, sometimes when master's pro master's theses are then further developed into PhD theses, um, dissertations, and then turned into books. Um, that said, um, you know everyone on faculty has been through the process of um, of turning a thesis, whether it's uh, you know typically again a PhD thesis, but um, turning going through the process of of turning that kind of research that is initially presented within academia into books that are um, aimed at aimed at Often broader audiences outside of academia, and so um, you know we're uh, able to advise on on that process based on our own experiences, our knowledge of different um, uh, publishers, etc. Um, so that's you know that's part of what we do for those students who are interested in, in going in that route, and also for those students, there's some amount of students every year who decide that they want to go on to a PhD program. Um, and so we've typically also been in that role of supporting students who are trying to choose between different programs and, and then often writing letters of recommendation, et cetera, for those who want to take that route. And the second part of the question, sorry, I focused on the first one. Um, the, second question, the second part of the question was, to what extent does CMS overlap with the HASS right. program? Mm -hmm. um, some of the, the graduates from CMS have actually applied. Once they finish their master's, they apply into that program. So there are some students who have taken that route. And in fact, I think there's one student, Mariella, mm -hmm. is in there right now. Um, and um, you know, I think there are some faculty that are even affiliated with that program. Um, so you could also take elective classes from faculty members who are teaching in that program if it worked with your schedule. and um, So there is a relationship. It's, I don't know how formalized it is, but there's certainly like, you know, movement across CMS and HASTS um, yeah. in terms of students and faculty. And the, the colloquium that we had last week with Lucy Suchman was a, a HASTS related event too. STS helped to co-organize that with our department. And so a lot of the students from that program that are doctoral students were, were there. So you would have opportunities for over, overlap, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And conversely, their students uh, sometimes seek out uh, CMS professors to work with on their dissertation. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. I have another question from the interwebs. Uh, I'm going to summarize this a little bit because it's a fairly long question. Um, but there is a woman who has been reading about the logistics economy in the U.S.-Mexico border um, and about Silicon Border, a 9,000-acre development on the Mexico side of the border, and is wondering um, if CMS is a program where she could conduct research on surveillance and tech investment 
in the border region for a scholarly thesis, um, but also with a speculative novella component allegorizing the technological landscape in the border region as part of the thesis? That's a question I have not come across before. So I'll toss that out to you guys. Do you want to talk about the first part? Yeah, I mean, well, there's certainly a, a kind of emergent move in the discipline of media studies to focus on this sub area called logistical media, or sometimes it's called locative media, but to really study how media are involved in mapping and tracking the movement of people and objects in the world, even you know, not just entertainment, but even how it's in, involved in the global supply chain in a way. Um, so there's a lot of interest in logistical media and surveillance within comparative media studies. Um, in terms of the format of the thesis, I think there have been options to do a more conventional scholarly part of the thesis combined with a creative dimension of it. And I think there's a pretty clear precedent for that and that you would just need to be in close dialogue with the, the person you select to be the mentor of your thesis or the advisor for your thesis and committee members to keep them informed about your thoughts and to, to be open to advice about how you might shape it to mm -hmm. be better. Yeah, I mean, that has been, it's been common within the program to, to incorporate one or another form of, of creative, productive, um, you know, practice-based work um, as parts of theses. There have been um, theses in the past that were done in um, where there was a written component as well as a short documentary um, and or interactive project of some kind. Um, there, um, last year, one of our students, Rika Malhotra, did a, um, a, a podcast series as part of her written thesis or in combination with the written thesis. Um, there are some written theses that that take the productive, um, the production element that they do as sort of a, as a, a case study about which to write the thesis as well, right, the, um, Shannon? There have been cases where the the production part is not um, sort of an additional comp component, but actually part of the process of doing the research, um, and. Um, and, you know, when it comes to speculative fiction, I mean, I think that our, the CMS program is, would be a unique place um, in, in regard to the fact that we are, um, as a larger unit, connected to writing um, compared to media studies, and writing is our larger unit. Um, and we have a, a number of very, uh, of really amazing people to work with on the writing side. Um, and there have been, uh, faculty members who are predominantly, you know, teach on the writing, um, teach writing, um, who have um, acted as uh, thesis advisors and, and readers, et cetera. So, um, you know, I think that there would be an opportunity to do, to do that kind of work. Um, I have something to add, which mm -hmm. is not directly related to the questions, but I noticed that we have international students. Uh, sometimes um, there are needs for international students to do field work um, as part of uh, uh, the process of, of, of working on their thesis. And we have, a, we have a program on campus which is called MISTI that sends graduate students um, uh, during the IAP, the, 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 the month of January, and the summertime. Uh, they provide fellowships uh, for graduate students to go to, let's say, Brazil or China uh, to do intern, uh, to do internships, uh, uh, which enables the students uh, to collect data and uh, to incorporate field work into their thesis. Yeah, an example of that is a student last year, a Chilean student, wanted to study how um, indigenous Mapuche communities in Chile who live in areas where there are a lot of natural resource extraction, um, how, they were, how their lives were being affected by state police drones that were flying around. So she actually got one of those grants to, to go and do field work in those areas and 
engage with the community so that she could understand from their perspective. She did some photographic and video documentation as well. And then that became part of her written thesis. So her thesis was a write-up of her findings, but it was heavily documented with uh, video materials and, and also maps that she created. But she benefited from one of those grants. So if you'd like to do a kind of more field-based, ethnog ethnographically inspired type of research, I think our program is very open to that, that kind of work. And, um, you know, thanks for mentioning that. Got another one. We have a very active <laughs> chat room yeah. here. Um, this this may apply, pardon me, to some people in the audience as well. Which is, what recommendations do you have for prospective applicants who are currently professionals and haven't been students for some time, more than five years? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. That's it's important because um, we actually like to be a program that we're open to people that have been out in the workforce for a while after graduating from school and had maybe a few years of work and want to come back to do a master's. Some of our students also just continue on straight from doing their bachelor's degree into a master's. But if you've been out in the workforce for a while, from my own opinion, and maybe the other panelists have different feelings, I think the writing sample is really important. I think one of the things we value when we're looking at the applications and files is to see that you can actually write clearly and thoughtfully. Um, and so taking time to really work on the writing sample and make sure it's as polished a piece of writing as you can before submitting it would be an important thing to do. And then sometimes when you've been out of, in the workforce for a while, you're not as connected to people, academic people who might write letters of recommendation. It's important that people who do write letters of recommendation can really speak in detail about your strengths as a student and as somebody who can contribute to the community and be able to comment on things you've done in the past that are suggestive of your success in a graduate program. Um, and I'll just add, as someone who, I, I was working in documentary film production and web production for about 12 years before I decided to pursue a graduate degree. Um, and one thing that I, so a couple of things. One is that, um, you know, there's, a, a, we recognize a, a great value in that, in bringing that experience into the program. Um, and, uh, you know, because often, and I know this was the case with my own, in my own experience, is that I had had a, uh, quite a clear idea by the time I went to graduate school of why I wanted to be there and how it sort of fit in, in an overall trajectory um, that was going from documentary film into academia. And um, what I would say, um, and this is, this is the case really for everybody, but um, perhaps even more so for those who've been um, out of academia for, for a period of time, um, it's important in your, um, in your narrative that you, that you um, sent the narrative part of your application to us um, to convey to us a kind of your own trajectory. You know, why is it? You know, what have you been doing in the past X number of years? How has it led you to the point where you want to go to graduate school? Why this graduate pr program? And what you ha hope to do here that is, in a sense, you know, building on whatever has brought you to this point in time, right? So it's really helpful for us to, to see you spell out that trajectory and how this program, how you imagine this program would fit in that trajectory. So if you've been, you know, working in media or in any field for the last five, six years, um, you know, what is it that, you know, that either that work has brought you to that you want to explore in greater detail or what, what, what has it been that has been lacking in that work that you feel really drawn to and you feel like this is the place where you could actually delve into um, you know, these other interests or, or ideas. 
Um, and, and then how you see all of that sort of adding up to what you might do afterwards. Um, so, and you know, a lot of us work in forms of narrative forms of media. So, so creating your own narrative and kind of um, giving us a sense of your own narrative and how the program fits is always a really um, good way to think about your approach to your um, essay uh, section of the uh, or the um, you know narrative state the statement uh, part of your application. Come on, we can't have all the questions from the web. That's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every year it's different, um, obviously, but. Um, Can you repeat the question? Oh, yes. The question is. Um, the question is what we're looking for in a cohort. And, um, you know, I would say it's different every year because it's a different group of people who are applying every year. But I think that because, um, because there's a great variety in what our faculty's interests are, um, that typically then translates to, um, to a, a, a similar variety in um, in the students that are admitted each year, because there, clearly there are certain um, there are certain students who who um, you know would appear to have a particular kind of synergy with a particular um, faculty member, um, or you know explicitly you know want to work with a particular faculty member. Uh, you know there are people who are drawn because we have. Some faculty who work in gaming, and some faculty who work in, in um, you know whether it's satellite technologies, etc. So it's you know that variety in what we do typically creates a great variety in who applies, and then translates into a variety um, of e within each cohort. So um, and uh, yeah, I mean I, I don't know whether that that kind of answers your question, I mean, there's sort of, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, that there's a, that variety is sort of built in, in, in some way. So every, every cohort is going to have um, people who are interested in different things um, and people who are coming from different backgrounds in terms of what we were talking about before, some people who are coming straight out of college or recently out of college, others who's been working, others who've been working in different fields for a while. Um, and that's, that's what keeps each, I think, each cohort really dynamic is that, that range. Yeah, I don't know if I, you yeah, want to... I would say we try to strike a balance um, of intellectual diversity, also diversity in terms of place. So in, in the last few years, I think we um, we, we try harder to make sure we have international yes. students. We also have uh, minority students, right? Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it also depends upon the pool. But we do think about gender and racial and ethnic um, diversity. We also, I think we even think about class issues. I remember somebody applied and wrote a really compelling personal statement about growing up in a working class white rural community and yet working really hard in school and really wanting to be at MIT. And I believe that person is now a student at UC Berkeley Law School, you know, having come out of our, our program. So it, it could be, you know, and we, we have admitted a lot of um, international students. For me, that's a priority. I, in, in trying to think about my lab too, wanting to have international perspectives in our classrooms and so that we learn from diverse viewpoints from around the world. Um, and one way that we can, that that can happen is by admitting international students as well. And, and students from, the, from North America that have a lot to offer. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a good question. There's not like a formula that we have but we, we do think about diversity carefully, a lot of us that serve on the com committees. 
Yeah. There was another hand back there. Mm -hmm. As you talk about creating the narrative in the application, and as we're telling our stories to you all in the application, would you recommend or accept any other supplemental materials, or would you recommend a, a portfolio of some sort? Um, there is there is place within the within the application to um, to submit a portfolio of work. Um, is that Shannon? Is that um, is that that's an optional portfolio? Is optional, right. but many of our applicants do submit additional material. Right. Yeah. So the question was, um, do we recommend that people submit additional materials just for the people? Oh, right. Um, and so, what we tend to get most of is a writing sample, because a lot of the people that serve on the admissions committee like to see that the person can not just write a personal statement, but maybe ha can submit a sample of a research paper that they've done. Because some of, the, some of you would be coming in and being assigned to a research lab, and so those lab directors want to see that you could work on a collaborative team and contribute your research skills to help out. Let's say you had to go look up a whole bunch of citations and help with the publication of an article. Or, so, so having a writing sample that shows that you, you can do research. Um, and, and that shows critical and analytical skills mm -hmm. of some kind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and sometimes people submit um, like an audio visual portfolio if they've worked on films or game projects they they submit that as an as an attachment too so yeah or links to a website with an online portfolio mm -hmm. or whatever sometimes mm -hmm. can they be uh, the result of collaboration with say a professor or does they have to be single authors they can't be the question was, can it be a collab? If you're submitting materials on the portfolio, can it be a collaboration with a professor or others, or does it have to be single authored? I would say it can be a collaboration. It's fine as long as it's identified as such. And if you're a co author or a co creator of something, just to make sure that all the authorship is indicated so that that's accurate and other and people's you, efforts are represented. And, you know, if it's if it's work that, that you feel we should be thinking about as a significant part of your application, um, then, you know, it, it may be that you want to work into your statement, you know, writing about what role, what specific roles you played in that, that particular project and, mm -hmm. you know, what you might have gained from it or what, what in that project sparked your interest in, you know, what you're interested in now, et cetera. So, so, you know, in other words, those elements of the portfolio could be not just sort of finished works, but also uh, opportunities for you to talk about your experience and interests. I was going to ask you guys, um, no cohort is perfect, and so I was wondering, uh, when your students have problems, where do they have problems? What tends to be developed by your Shannon, you might want. Shannon's the yeah. first line often. Um, <laughs> Shannon's like, where do I start? That's a yeah. tough one. So we've had, um, we had a, a couple of students who felt that um, there was a problem with MIT and race last year. And, um, but that, that was fairly new to us. Most students, if they come in and they have problems, it is with the, the load of the academic work balancing with the um, research assistant work and trying to balance the time management. Um, sometimes we have problems that are utterly completely unrelated, like when poor Josefina's apartment building burned down. Um, yeah. And um, FYI, there's a, a team at MIT called the CARE team that is called to action when these things happen. And they have representatives from all across the institute that can help find emergency housing, emergency food funding, and things like that. Um, I, it's hard to say if there's any typical problems that arise every year. We, we try, if, a, if students are having a tough time in any particular area, and it seems to be all the students are having a tough time, we try to address that area so that it doesn't continue to be a problem in the future. 
Does that? I think sort of as a matter of practice, um, it's also just, I think the faculty try to encourage the students to come directly to them if they have an issue. Maybe, the, you know, if there was an issue in a class being taught or the readings were, the, the volume of the reading were too heavy and, um, the, you know, I think some people really encourage the students to provide direct feedback and have that kind of rapport. So I think that's an informal way that some challenges might get addressed. Um, and I, we have a director of graduate studies that the students could go to and report problems or complaints or issues. And usually once that would happen, Shannon would be looped in as well, and sometimes even the department head. There's also the um, dean of graduate education here at MIT, her name is Blanche Staten, and she is, gets quite involved if there are student issues that emerge that need to be addressed. And there are associate deans in her office that also meet regularly with students. Um, I have noticed a shift just in my own experience in terms of the students here as opposed to the University of California system. I think this is a really intense work environment for students and sometimes people can get overwhelmed. And so I, I do think it's really important if you were to come here to just make sure to reach out to people and um, let folks know if you need support or help. And I feel that this campus does want to do whatever it can to try to offer assistance and resources, um, even more so than other, some other campuses. But it is, you know, it's a, it's a very high level research institute and it can be pressure cooker for some, um, so I think, you know, it's, it's important just to be aware of that, and it's, I think the cohorts have their solidarities sometimes, too, that are really helpful. Yeah, the, the small cohort does help. Um, at the undergraduate level, the, the built-in safety nets are much more implicit. There's a lot more intervention that will happen if a student seems to be coming overwhelmed. At the graduate level, there is there are tremendous resources available, but the, it assumes that a graduate student will know themselves well enough to ask for help. People won't necessarily intervene unless it seems to be, a, the situation is very, very dire. But the resources are there for students who need them. I missed the very yeah, first the part of it. Part, yeah. it was how, how focused does um, our students' research interests usually when they come in? Mm -hmm. And once they're exposed to the broader intellectual community of MIT, um, do they change? It's, it's a really important question because with a master's program that's two years long, with the idea of completing a thesis at the end of the second year, it goes by very quickly. Um, and so I think it's this balancing act of co wanting, coming in with some, some general idea of what you want to focus on, but also allowing yourself to be open to the, the courses you're taking, the readings that you're doing, and, and what you're learning, and being able to refine that general idea or concentrate it or direct it in a way that's going to a, you know, position you to be able to be benefiting from and receptive to what you're learning. Um, but since it goes very quickly, what I've witnessed is that the students that tend to be able to finish their theses and feel pretty good about them come in with a pretty, pretty good idea of what they want to focus on. And then they're able to use their assignments and their seminar classes to do work that's geared toward completing the thesis even though not all of the coursework might be directly related to the thesis. So it's a little bit of a balancing yeah. act of like wanting to have something in mind, but we have seen people change course and yeah. say, I came in thinking I wanted to do this, but now that I've taken the first semester of classes, I really know that I don't want to do that and I want to do this. So I think you should feel free to yeah. be open to that possibility. 
that's not uncommon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm afraid I have to duck out to go teach. Um, but thank, thank you all, you. And, and I will let you guys continue. Yeah. Thank you, right. thank right. you. Thanks. Thanks so much. If there are no questions, I have questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just curious about what you're looking for in a media studies program. What brought you here? Mm -hmm. Do you have some ideas, I mean, about what kind of program that you you are shopping for? My yeah? impression was that most humanities uh, departments that, that, be, that there's sort of an, an aversion to technology. There's something slightly anachronistic about, you know, for example, I was in a class that was um, no laptops allowed, you know, just like, like studying Hegel or whatever. And it's sort of, I just like, I, I, I love how there's a real, there seems to be like an embrace of the technology and trying to find a new way to, yeah, synthesize those two here, as well as the focus on the social and political issues. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you'll definitely find that um, people embrace the study of technology and many in, this, in the humanities and social sciences and even the arts here would think about it as the, a foundational assumption might be that it's, that technology is always about socio-technical relations as opposed to a kind of tech techne that's separate from the social or the human. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people in different ways are investigating that set of relationships. So, mm -hmm. yes. I have another question. Um, I know earlier you were all talking about how you built your cohort and the diversity that you're looking at for across the board. Um, I'm curious to know if professors are given any um, cultural competency training, especially with all the um, writing and editing that goes along with this process Mm -hmm. Critique is actually critique and not based on mm. The short answer to that is sort of. There are there is cultural competency training available to faculty, um, but it is difficult to require faculty to um, to do that kind of training. Most of our faculty are very interested in cultural competency in um, the study of implicit bias in addition to um, the study of their own research. And so I think they are interested in critique as opposed to bias. Um, but I can't say that everyone has been required to do that. Unless you guys have Yeah, I, I, I don't think there's, um, there's not formal cultural competency training sessions here at MIT. Um, I think that some of the faculty have tried to read um, in certain literatures to try to understand the complexity of race relations and um, ethnicities in relation, as well as um, complex issues related to gender and sexuality. Um, but it's not it's not mandatory in terms of our faculty training. I think there are some that are more interested in and open to those discussions intellectually and as a matter of education and practice. And some you know, tend to not prioritize that as much in their work. But overall, our, I think our faculty are really open to talking through and trying to address the issues that I think are underlying your, your question. Um, it's an important thing to, to, to raise. I have a few more comments on from oh, the internet. Sure. <laughs> As you asked what people were, what, what drew them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so Natalia Reyes says, I became interested in this program because a friend in the MIT Media Lab suggested I look into the interdisciplinary possibilities in CMS after discussing. Uh, sorry, after discussing the femicide machine by Sergio Gonzalez Rodriguez and technologies of surveillance and the border with relation to the novella idea. Uh, we also had a more general question about GREs. 
how how highly GREs are weighted on the application, and I'm guessing that some people out here are also wondering about that, if you want to answer. I, you know, I sat on the admissions committee many years. Um, I, well, I think we, the most important thing uh, for me, at least, is the personal statement. Um, and the scores, I mean, everybody's scoring high. Um, well, the scores are not as important as conveying through your personal statement uh, who you are and what your, um, what, what your values are um, and how your past accomplishments uh, lead you to where you are. So I would say personal statement uh, outweighs um, scores. What, I, what I feel that too. Yeah. I, I, I personally feel that too when I'm reviewing a, a file. Um, but I do know that um, sometimes you have a whole, you know, when you're reviewing these applications, the, the GRE scores do matter to some people, especially the writing scores, yeah. because they get concerned if you don't score high in the writing category that, or the analytical category, that it might be a challenge for doing some of the research work. But um, yeah, and they, you know, I think you just have to do the best you can on those, those tests. People have very mixed feelings about standardized testing at this moment <laughs> in time. And um, so you just have to try to score the highest you can. But I agree that the writing, the personal statement is really what's important. Um, for the required courses, can you talk a little more about the curriculum, the any sources that are represented every year in those, or how you decide what sources to include? Um, yeah, the core curriculum, it really depends. Um, I think there's a certain amount of consistency in that some of the professors are teaching the same class year after year. Um, but they're also trying to update the, the bibliographies for those courses. Um, I think if you're interested in that, it might be best to reach out to request some sample syllabi from the classes, because I don't have them all memorized here. But, um, you know, it, it really just depends on, on the class and who's teaching it. Um, but I think it's a kind of conversation that you should, maybe we can talk to Shannon and myself and try to send you some syllabi if you want to see what are things on the reading list. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of what is the core course now, uh, right now, during this semester. It's the it's um, William Arricchio is teaching the media theories and methods right now, mm -hmm. and um, I I used to teach the media uh, major media texts. Again, I just moved here a few years ago, um, but this was a class that had been developed to deal with theories of textuality in relation to various media forms, from films to TV to games and websites. Um, and so, you know, we did a, 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 like at least four articles per week that were related to various themes in the class. And I'd be happy to share the syllabus with you if you, if you want to send me an email. Yeah. so you can get a sense of what that looks like. Right now I'm teaching an elective seminar, um, and it's um, called Media Studies, Machine Learning, and AI. And it's an attempt to try to look at how media studies and media industries are shifting in relation to new recommender systems and search technologies. So we're reading, we read a book called The Black Box Society, we read a book, we've been reading a book a week because I've decided to assign books in this class so that the students can understand how to conceptualize a thesis, which is a longer form than just an essay. And so I've been thinking, encouraging them to think about what does it mean to write a, a, a book, you know, to, to read and write a book. Because a thesis is like a small book. So you need to understand the structure of a book in order to be able to conceptualize a thesis. Um, so we, we read the Black Box Society, we read Algorithms of Oppression by Sophia Noble, 
We read Behind uh, the Screen, which is a new book that just came out from Sarah Roberts about content moderators and the social media space. Um, we're reading a book called Netflix Nations about the globalization of the Netflix platform. And we're reading a book called Spotify Teardown about a group of researchers that tried to understand how Spotify works from the inside. And since they faced a lot of blockages from the company, they had to invent their own collaborative research methods. And so the book is kind of about that process. So each week we've been reading a different book to try to understand what it means for media studies to be merging with these new types of um, computing technologies, machine learning, and AI tools. We also read a book called Burden of Choice by Jonathan Cohen about recommender systems. Um, so, Can so. We don't. <laughs> Sorry, the question was whether you guys could visit classes. Yeah, if you're we, local. <laughs> we don't usually invite prospective um, applicants to visit classes um, because our cohort is very small and it, it would end up, you would end up outnumbering the students in the classroom. But we do invite, once students are admitted, we do invite them when they're making their decision to attend or not to come and meet with faculty and sit in on a class and attend thesis day. That was actually a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, how often do students leave with technical skills that they can come in with? So I know that there are the workshops, but how often do students really hone those skills? And secondly, what skills do you guys hope that students leave with, be they qualitative or quantitative or technical? Well, in my lab, my one of the goals is um, I try to to do um, collaborative field work as part of the, the training, in research training. And I also encourage students to do a lot of writing, um, not just blog posts, but I, we do co-authored peer-reviewed journal publications in the lab. So I tend to be more of a humanities type of orientation. Um, but so I, and I don't have the training to train students to do a lot of you know, software, learning software and doing a lot of multimedia production. Um, but I think, I don't know, I think that in the workshop, people tend to learn a lot from each other as well as from the, the professor who invites um, tech experts to come into the workshop quite a bit and showcase um, various tools and possibilities for use in their own work. Um, my expectations and hopes are mostly grounded in providing a space for students to get involved in scholarly research, not just here at MIT, but out beyond this place, and to learn from engaging with people that um, live in different circumstances than, than they, they have. Um, yeah, um, and I would, I would say that if you have some um, basic coding skills, that's always helpful. You have a more competitive advantage. But if you don't, <laughs> we have had students come in. Uh, we had a documentarian come in who has zero skills in VR and discovered it while he was here and really dove right in and ended up um, leaving with a lot of VR skills uh, that he hadn't had previously. And we've had um, humanists come in and um, study coding and programming. In fact, one of our faculty, Nick Montfort, created a class for them called Exploratory Programming in the Arts and Humanities. And so they ended up with a lot of programming skills that they hadn't come in with. So it's, it's absolutely possible, but it depends a lot on the student, how they want to spend their elective time, their workshop time, et cetera. Anything else? Any, any other questions or comments or? Yes. Yeah, hi, another question. Um, you know, I, I'm very interested in coming to MIT, also looking at other programs, and so for other students who may be exploring other programs, um, can you talk about the value of media studies here at MIT and doing this kind of work here versus other, other solid media studies programs at other institutions from your perspective? 
think you should show the slide of the definition. She came in late. Oh, okay. Um, but repeat the question, too. <laughs> so the question was about what is the value of a media studies experience and degree from here at MIT relative to other, maybe compared to other um, really high quality. I was. You were. OK, 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 OK. It seems Yeah. Yeah. No, this is, so just to give you a sense, I think this is a really important question from a student perspective when you're thinking about which program is going to be a good fit for you. And I think it has to do with um, the overall environment of the university, or in this case, institute, and what resources are available for students. I mean, here, if you get into the program, you pretty much get um, a, a research assistantship that pays for you to go to school and get the degree. That isn't always going to be the case in all um, media studies MA or MS programs. Um, sometimes they're quite competitive and people pay, take out student loans and pay out of pocket to get that master's degree. If you're admitted here, you're, that is, is, oh, my Siri is responding to me. <laughs> um, you know, that, that, I think that's a really important part of it is to think about the financial aspect. The second part is I think we have a very um, unique and eclectic faculty. Some people in our department have a background in sociology. Some are documentary filmmakers. Some are more humanities-based media scholars. Some have a background in cognitive science and interactive media and art. Um, so you're, and, and then yet others have a, a, a background in rhetoric. Um, so you have a broad spectrum of disciplines that are represented among our faculty in the comparative media studies program. If you're looking for like a really niche, focused program that's very human humanities-based, um, this one is a little different from that. And there's also, I think I would say there's a lot more of an emphasis on applied media education here, not just the reading and the writing, um, but like the making part it tends to be quite important in terms of the classes that are offered and developed here and the, the workshop mo module that you end up participating in. Um, I think also just being, you know, part of our department is in one building. Our department's pretty scattered in terms of the physical plant of MIT. And sometimes, to go back to a question earlier, how do you deal with some of the problems and challenges? I think that's one of the challenges that we have is that we're a little bit scattered. And so labs might be in one building and classes might be over here and meetings kind of. But I think we try to do our best to, to use the colloquium to bring people together. and. Um, and there's a sense of community that forms around that event, and it brings in people not just from CMS, but from literature, from um, architecture, and um, even um, the Department of Urban Planning. And uh, you know, it comes over. They're called DUSP, right? Department, Department of Urban Studies. And urban planning. Studies and Planning. Um, so, and then the final thing I will say is um, that MIT is a powerful brand and that when you have MIT on your CV or resume, it can automatically impress some people. Now, after the scandal that our campus just went through, it might also make people raise their eyebrows. You should be aware of that. And I don't know if you're aware of the, the scandal that our campus has been going through over the past several months with regard to accepting financing from uh, uh, a kind of problematic entity. Um, and if anyone wants to talk about that one-on-one, -on -one, I'm happy to discuss that with you. But, but overall, I think the brand of MIT is a very powerful one. And having moved from a public university to MIT in the last few years, you just even notice the shift in the way that people respond, you know, and when you say where you work. <laughs> And I, I personally don't always buy those brand things. I, you know, I, I think we have to have a measured relationship to those things. But I do think that this is a place that has a, a, a history, 
it, it, it's known pretty well not only in the United States but throughout the world and um, I think a lot of the people here really want to do good, like they really do want to do good scholarship and do use technology to try to facilitate social change. Yeah. So I'm Andrew Whitaker. I'm the communications manager here. Um, Jane and I were just talking about this the last few days as I did some research on similar oh. programs. So this might be like a ground level answer to your question. So one of the things I've done over the past couple of years is look at the other schools. So when you, when you apply, one thing that you can or always mention are other schools that you're applying to. Um, so I was able to take that information to see what was most common like where people most commonly also apply. Um, and then match that against some rankings that had come out again this year to show the top media studies and communication programs. Um, and look at what the, the basics of those other programs, what were they focused on. And so the difference ended up being, and, and, and being where we stood out, was that places like uh, Yale was a common like also applied to program. And that's film and media studies. So that was almost purely humanities. They, they're, they're not building anything there. But you also had a place like, uh, I think Georgia Tech was one, um, where it's all building with a little bit of like theory kind of tacked on. Um, the big thing here is that it's all this virtuous cycle throughout the curriculum, is that um, while you're taking theories and methods, you're also working with a research group on projects, coming out with a portfolio at the end, whether it's code that you've written, or art that you've created, or presentations that you've delivered on behalf of your research group. Um, all of those things work together so that you come out with something that's really well-rounded. I just put up this slide because one of the things, I had to do a talk recently about uh, at, at the 30th anniversary of a doctoral program. And I had one of the students in my lab um, pull some data from the National Center for Educational Statistics to try to look at the growth of media studies over the last 30 or so years. And this is a, we're going to be putting a blog post up on my website about this soon, so this is a little fresh. But um, it shows that overall, um, media studies, at least coming out of a social science, there's two tracks. One comes out of the social sciences and one comes out of the humanities. And in both tracks, we see pretty steady growth over the last 30 years. So media studies is really a growth area. And when we write this up on my website, we're going to put all the, the numbers of how many programs there were in 1984 and how many there were in the last year that we pulled the data, which is 2017, so you get a sense. We also have some charts that break enrollment in BA, Master's, and PhD programs down by gender and race and ethnicity as it's collected by the, the national um, government. And so the, the, the series of slides will include that too. But I just put this up because we do, it is a growth field, you know. And the big drop here is explained because basically the data set was classified as journalism and mass comm until 1992. And then they pulled journalism out of the data set. And so it made the stats go down really low because journalism was put in its own category. And then they changed the category to mass comm, and then it started to kind of increase and grow up, go up again. Um, but we have the series for the, the, this as well as the film programs, which come out of a kind of a different institutional track. But I bring this up just to say that this is a growth field, and there are many programs and institutions that, so, that have really strong media programs. Uh, it's a fascinating discipline. And um, it's one where there's a lot of cutting edge work going on, I think, and a lot of um, interesting possibilities for, for the futures of your careers and, and entering the workforce, whether you go in academia or other, other fields. So. I guess the other thing I'll add about that, you guys might have seen this on the website, but we did some surveys over the last couple of years. This is just very basic stuff. Uh, the, in a survey of our alums, the median salary um, one year out of the graduate program was $60,000. Five years out of the program was over $100,000. Um, the breakdown of industries, which might get to the kinds of questions you have today, uh, was about 30% of people go on to get PhDs and then get academic jobs. 
Um, and then everybody else is scattered through a whole bunch of different industries. There's people who go into media fields, into industry, um, into you know entrepreneurial roles. They're working with startups. Um, I'm trying to think of whatever. I don't think there's a large enough category to, to describe all the different things that people go on to, other than academia and not academia. Um, uh, but people really, really thrive uh, once they leave that team. Did you have a question that you wanted to ask? Sorry. Yes. Oh, oh. Yeah, actually. Um, you, it kind of ties into sort of the other things that you guys were talking about. Um, you're talking about sort of the balance between research and production. Um, and you had asked, you know, why people were interested you know, in MIT specifically. And for me, yep. it's because mm -hmm. you guys produce so much great stuff. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of people that, you know, are building really good things here. But I've heard a lot about your research um, and not as much about the production. Um, so can you hear a little bit more about the types of things that you guys are building out of your department? Well, um, I think in my little speech I talked about uh, my work on civic media. I'm an activist um, and a professor at the same time. So I, I'm, I'm running this uh, NGO, um, grassroots NGO, doing work with... Uh, we have a huge network of... Uh, of NGOs in China. It's about uh, like thousands of them. Yeah, we train them um, to enhance their social media digital literacy, and we have lots of products coming out of that. Uh, we recently launched a project on Future Village. Uh, we, we identify villages that have um, technological or communication problems, and we do civic hackathons, and we create prototypes. So that's some kind of a, that's a kind of production-driven uh, uh, project. And uh, Lisa, you too, you, you recently did uh, workshops yeah, in so Africa, and you're going to do one in Brazil. Yeah, um, some of the, the students in my lab, we've done a, a series of workshops called Social IT Solutions. And the idea is to um, partner with universities. We partnered with the, uh, the Dar es Salaam Institute of Technology and the State University of Zanzibar in Tanzania last January during the IAP. And we went there and ran a two-week workshop. With the, we partnered with faculty and students there. And um, by the end of the two weeks, the students worked in teams and they did project prototypes um, after having gone out into the field and done interviews or um, observations in the, the, the urban space of things that they felt the internet or um, mobile phone apps or other technologies would be useful. Um, so it wasn't just driven by kind of the platformization of the world where everybody has to use the same platform in the same way. But what does it mean to have ground up um, grassroots conversations among people in diverse communities about the kind of technologies that they like to develop and create and benefit from financially themselves? And so we had six teams and they had, all this stuff is on our website too, but they, they did everything from an emergency services um, app. They don't have a 911, so if somebody is sexually assaulted, you can't just grab your phone and call 911. Um, they, they actually they have a very inefficient emergency services infrastructure, so they had developed a whole, they had gone to a place and interviewed some police and, and um, it developed a whole system for this that they presented and they got covered on the national TV networks and in the national press. And others were doing um, projects where they were trying to develop um, a, a kind of aggregate the prices of produce at marketplaces around the city so that people with limited incomes could know where they could get the produce they needed at the right price given their limited time and moving around the city. Um, and that project was really amazing. Another group focused on lines that they had to wait in at the hospital, the bank, um, at kind of public service sector places, and they just would wait. They'd have to take off a day of work just to take their baby to the hospital for a day. 
and they'd lose all the income that day. So they did a project called QX so that they could know when to go there and that there wasn't a line or they could get a spot in line. So it was really inspiring to us to get a sense of the, the technologically um, grounded needs that people felt that they could evolve and develop themselves in these groups. And I mean, that's just a very brief overview of things that I think are actually really more nuanced and complex. So, um, but, yeah. and there are a lot of other people in the department doing more kind of applied types yeah. of projects. Educational games, actually, yeah. five o'clock. Educational games. In educational yeah. games. Uh, Eric uh, Klopfer is giving a talk on participatory design. We also have a design lab that uh, works with uh, um, government industry and uh, communities to create uh, uh, design thinking driven products. And the, the game lab <coughs> students have also created their own video games. Uh, one of my favorites was called The Slower Speed of Light, <laughs> which um, allowed you to <coughs> see the world as if you were traveling at the speed of light and how it might work. Um, I, I recommend Googling it, it's kind of fun. Um, and we've had students create um, virtual reality games dealing with um, socioeconomic class and um, income. So it, yeah, there, there are a tremendous number of projects, actual hands-on stuff coming up. Um, if you're admitted, uh, you are assigned as a research assistant to a lab, and that is for nine months out of the year, so for, for two years. You have summers off unless your lab has money and you want to work. Um, you are not required to work on MIT breaks, so at Christmas break and for spring break, you would have time off. And those assistantships, um, they're within this program? Yes. Have you heard of situations where a student is able to do research at a place like desk for chance or split their time between the uh, So, <coughs> yes, if you, if you don't mind me taking this one. Go for it. Um, <coughs> yes, we have had students who had um, funding that could be moved around, who ended up working primarily with, the, with faculty and desk, and that worked out really well. We did have a student a few years ago who um, was hired as a research assistant by a faculty member at DUSP, and that did not work out so well. And so we're, we're cautious about students um, doing their research assistant outside of our program, because if you're working with a faculty that's not in our department, we can't tell them not to do something. So if they're asking their, their research assistant to do entirely clerical work, we can't say, hey, that's not the way we run our labs because it's not our lab. So it's, it's been done. Um, and I won't say, no, you can't. But I will say it's the sort of thing that is looked at cautiously. We prefer to keep students within our own group so that um, we can monitor and make sure that it's a healthy research assistant relationship. Anything else? Sure. Sure. Um, should there be a recession? <coughs> should there be a recession? Is that going to impact funding for students? Oh. Research assistants? You want me to take this one too? Well, I, in the okay. news I read today, MIT just got what was it, two hundred and sixty million dollars from the Lord, the sale of the Lord Corporation. Hmm. This was in the MIT news headline. So. I mean, the kind of gifts that we that MIT gets are kind of astounding, the scale. But it's a good question. The recession tends to impact some endowments at private universities and institutes. It hits public universities much harder because, uh, you know, they are dependent on federal funding and other often that gets cut in a, in a recession and even state funding. But I, I don't know the answer to that. I kind of doubt it, but I don't know for sure. 
So <laughs> the, the general attitude is that um, if our funding is somehow reduced, we're not going to accept students and not fund them. Um, and <laughs> MIT is a, doesn't have as much of an endowment as, as other private universities, and so we do rely a lot on the federal government, but this department doesn't rely as heavily on the federal government as, as the engineering and science uh, schools at MIT. So it's not to say we aren't affected by a recession, but um, it's not quite as bad. No. Well, thank you all very much for coming, and thanks for your questions and your interest in, in the program. And please feel free to let us know if you have questions one-on-one. -on -one. We'll stick on, around for a few minutes. And I just want to say thanks for coming today. And good luck to all of you. And you are all more than welcome to come to tonight's colloquium.